Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. My friend, John, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's great to be back. I see that the couch is still your recording location of choice. It is. It is. I'm, I'm having a better uh, dog slash podcast experience from the couch than I do from the kitchen, although uh, it does not allow me to uh, have a, a pot of tea because uh, there's nowhere to put it on the couch, of course. But um, there's less dog up and down, back and forth, in and out, so to speak. I understand. And the sound quality, I'm feeling like it's about the same. So good for you. Change good is for good. Me. Good for us. Good for everybody. Yes. Oh, by the way, this is episode 10, season four, uh, which I'd means you're going to be listening to uh, chapter 10 of Miser's Dream. But before then, we're going to take uh, a trip back in time to a few moments from our conversation a couple of years back with Tina Leonard. And I say this with pride. That's something I can say others can't. Tina Leonard was at my wedding. She was at your wedding and she performed at your wedding, which was my first experience with seeing Tina Leonard perform. What a perfect, I mean, she, she should, it's a perfect act. Just perfect. It could, but how great at a wedding. She I know. should just market that. I'll do your wedding. And it's just, it's <laughs> such a perfect little experience. Uh, and it, the only experience I've had with Mop Man other than virtually. And it was sublime. You know, it was a interesting path getting there. Uh, my good friend, Bill Arnold, who was doing triple espresso at the time, uh, he was doing it in Ireland. He could not be at the wedding, which I think still uh, annoys him. And a magician named Arden James was going to come and do it. Arden, uh, I'd met him in Wisconsin. I'd worked on a number of corporate events with him. He's a brilliant uh, magician and pantomime artist. And he actually yeah. has worked with Tina quite a bit over the years. And his father took ill and he couldn't do it. And I called Bill and said, Bill, help. Help me, Obi-Wan, help me. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. <laughs> and he thought about it and said, oh, well, obviously it's Tina Leonard. Let me give you her email address. And uh, boy, oh boy, we were so lucky that she was uh, willing to come to St. Paul. It was a crisp fall day when she arrived. She had everything in her act uh, in a very movable trunk with wheels. I mean, it was amazing the way she would gotten everything into one thing. That small place big. The venue where we were having our uh, reception advertised themselves as having uh, a stage and as I'm sure you know from your corporate world, there are stages and there are stages. Yes. To me, a stage is something where you have a backstage, you have a way of getting on stage and off stage without being seen by the audience. That was not the case here. This was uh, a fake stage uh, where the only way to get up onto the stage was from the house. And the only way to leave the stage was uh, go back into the house and disappear. There was no way, there's just no backstage. And we talked with Tina about how she wanted to do that. And she very adamantly said, I'm just going to go sit backstage and wait. And then uh, it was actually you, Jim, who cued her on stage. Uh, and I said, but Tina, that's, you're sitting back there for maybe 90 minutes because we had dinner first. Uh, and she said, nope, that's, I don't want to come from the house. It's going to work a whole lot better if I can just come from backstage. And that's what she did. She sat back there. And at a certain point, uh, I think you were giving a toast or something. And she pushed a card on stage and gestured for you to get off stage. And uh, Kevin Baganek hit the uh, play button on her track and we were off and running. And it was, the audience was stunned. They had never expected this and had never seen anything like it. Had you seen it before then, John? I had only seen it on video. I had never met her. Uh, and I'd never seen the act in real life, wow. but the video was so stunning. And yeah. like you said, it was, it was perfect for a wedding. It was, it's a very romantic piece, perfect piece. And, you know, I, I was dying to talk to her about Mop Man. It's, it, I really just was fascinated by the whole experience because it, it's not just a, a magic show. It's not just a mime show. It's an emotional, it hits you right in your heart. It's just a beautiful melding of things that you don't often get you don't often get those things melded together 
uh, to give you an emotional experience from a, a, what is essentially a magic show. So I was dying to talk to her about it. When the opportunity arose, I took it. So are we now to a place where we could just chat about Mop Man and how that right you, there, I mean, right, we right walked there. right up to it, but just <laughs> I, to, walk, uh, I walked yeah. right in. <laughs> how did that come about? Okay, first of all, I knew I couldn't do the doll act anymore, right? What can I do that's ageless? So I don't have to think about having to completely change everything every few years. Well, characters, cleaning lady character, that can work anywhere. And, and it's people associate with that. And it's uh, also it's the idea of a cleaning person is someone you don't really want to pay attention to because you want your place clean. So I, I like the idea that I, I could be somebody that would be finally find a place, find love, you know. So I knew that that was a good point for me to start with. Let me let me kind of go back a little bit. I've always been a, f a little bit uh, worried about being on stage as myself, you know, be hiding behind a mask is, was good because I didn't really think that anybody would ever want to look at me. So how was I going to get to a point where I would look okay? Well, I thought if I start as a really homely cleaning lady and I end up like in the evening gown, then I go from really ugly to not so ugly. You know, in other words, I don't have to run out on stage looking really beautiful. And then where do I go from there? I just rather start and then have an involvement. So the idea was to evolve it. Uh, okay, good. So how do I do that? Part of this whole process was that I was in Las Vegas and I saw a, a strip act of a, a woman um, that she took a coat and put it on her shoulder and kind of improvised a hat. And th that side became a man and the man began to like remove her clothing. So that was two characters. I'm a mime. Great. I love body division. And then that's where the fun for me began is because I really got to use my mime techniques to do that. Then, of course, the magic was the least, was my weakest point. And thankfully, I'm married to Mike Caveney, so that helped me there. <laughs> and I also had other magicians around that were just, you know, the, the magic world is great. It's great anyway. But when they see someone who's really interested that already has existing skills, I just was very, had really good fortune to know a, a good amount of great people that were willing to work with me on this. I think a big, my big word in performing, coming up with a routine or an act, it needs to be relevant. People need to understand what you're doing and they need to be affected by it emotionally. And if you don't get those two things, you, you could be the greatest artist in the world, but if you can't make that connection. So I found that if I turned it into a romantic story and with Mike's suggestion, like, like a Cinderella story, then that could be something that everybody could relate to. But yeah, there was all these little things that came together, not at once. I, I had only planned on doing that act for about three years, and I'm on my 34th year now. <laughs> it just kind of, it wouldn't leave me, <laughs> which is nice. I'm grateful, but um, I, I really wish that I knew the formula of that. I mean, I know it back thinking I know the formula. I wish I could think forward because I would love to be able to do more things like that. You mentioned connecting the dots, which I think is kind of a theme with you. Yes. Uh, and I think a lot of times... We can only connect the dots in retrospect. We're not you seeing. As, that, you know, that came from a Steve Jobs uh, speech. That's where I got the term. And that's exactly what he says. So you, can't, you can't form them yourself. So you just have to notice them. You have to, every time something happens to you, that, that I like the word goosebumps here, where, where you just get this feeling. that If that means something to you, then, then there's a possibility that you can transfer that. If somebody tells me that they saw my act and they got goosebumps, um, that makes gives me goosebumps. I mean, it makes me feel really good. So I want to see if I can transfer things that make me feel really good to others. And I think that's been as, as varied as my theme and my interests have been. My interest, my deep interest is to find things that make me feel good and then me find a way of having other people feel good. Isn't she just swell? She really is. Uh, such a delight and such a... Um... A humble, I, I just, I, I can't get enough of people like that. Yeah. It doesn't matter what they are or what they're talking about. If they know what they're talking about, they're an expert in what they're talking about mm -hmm. and they're kind. Uh, I I just can't get enough. I can't get enough of that. Yeah. Yeah. She talked about goosebumps and she absolutely has figured out how to do that. And I think as of that recording, 34 years, she's been doing what was going to just be a, a short term act as spread out uh, she does other things as well uh, she has a linking ring routine which is lovely and she plays the harp and you know she has other interests if you want to follow her on instagram you can see her doing yoga 
uh, with goats standing on her. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, 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 of course, would watch her do just about anything, including yoga with a goat. Uh, but if you haven't seen Mop Man, find it. Uh, are you be a link. Show notes? I will have a link yeah. to the best yeah. version of it I can find. But the best version of it really is being in the room and watching her yeah. do it. Have it have it happen live as as are most things. Uh, she, it's um, it's just so perfect. It's timeless. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this story that she tells through Mop Man is one that will never get old. It yeah. will never be tired. It will never be passe. It's just right there, and it's so sweet. And I loved it. And if you haven't seen it you should at least follow the link and then uh, try to figure out a way that you could see her do it live because that's probably when it's at its best. Or do anything live. I know she used to do a Halloween show with Rob Zabrecki and Arden James at the Magic Castle. Another reason to go to the Magic Castle and see see them do that. We don't need any more reasons. We should just go. I got to see her perform in uh, London at the Magic Circle. She and Mike Caveney, her husband, were there. And hey, sure helps to be married to Mike Caveney, doesn't it? Doesn't hurt. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't hurt. He's got. He's got some stuff all on his own. What a great couple they are! If you didn't listen uh, two episodes ago, Mike Caveney talked about Dante's uh, sawing in half illusion and trading that with David Copperfield, and now this time we have uh, Tina Leonard giving us a fine rendition of what it took to create a routine that uh, is uh, eternal. Eternal. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that is an objective truth. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's do some reading. What do you say? Uh, I think you should do the reading. I, I feel a little... I will. I, I'd be happy to. It's what I live for. Um, we're reading the third book in the series, The Miser's Dream. We finished chapter nine last episode, but just get us caught up. Give us chapter nine in a nutshell, will you? Sure thing. Chapter nine. Pretty cut and dried. We met Chip Kavanaugh in St. Paul the kind of uh, rich, odd collector. Eli got a call from Mr. Lime and then uh, came home and found that there was a pool of blood underneath the marquee at the Parkway Theater. And that takes us right into the next chapter. Chapter 10. I don't have all the details, but my understanding is that someone, person or persons unknown pushed or pulled the ladder from beneath her while poor Tracy was atop it. She landed on the sidewalk, sadly breaking her fall with her head. Harry was standing in the doorway to his apartment, just putting on his coat, while he brought me up to speed on the events of the afternoon. Is she okay? That is still an open question, he said, shutting the door behind him and heading down the narrow stairway toward the shop below. Megan was the one who found her. She called 911, and then when the ambulance came, Megan accompanied them to the hospital. I thought she would have called by now with a report, but my cell phone has been oddly silent. It's lucky someone was there, I said as we made our way through the dark shop. I think I should go down to the hospital and see how she's doing. I'm not entirely sure which she you mean, nor do I wish to know. But that's an excellent notion, Harry agreed. For a moment... I wasn't actually sure either. We parted ways in front of the shop, with me headed back toward my car, and Harry headed, I assumed, next door to Adrian's for a spot of dinner and some camaraderie with whichever members of the Minneapolis Mystics were in attendance that evening. However, as I pulled away from the curb and performed a neat U-turn in the middle of Chicago Avenue, I was surprised to see he had bypassed the door to the bar and was heading farther down the sidewalk. The stoplight was in my favor, so I didn't have time to think about it as I continued down the barely plowed street toward the hospital. There was no answer the several times I tried Megan's cell phone while I drove, but that seemed reasonable, as many hospitals limit the use of cell phones in some key areas. I imagined the emergency room was one of them. What was intended to be a quick check-in at the front desk took longer than anticipated when I realized, to my chagrin, that while I knew Tracy's first name, I had never bothered to learn her last. The front desk attendant was kind enough to perform a computer search using only the first name, and moments later, I was in the elevator on my way to the third floor. 
finding the room proved to be easier than anticipated, as I immediately spotted Megan as I exited the elevator. She was chatting with a man dressed in traditional blue hospital scrubs standing in front of the door to a patient room. Oh, Eli, she said, breaking into a sad smile. You must have heard. She grabbed my arm and pulled me into the conversation, giving my hand a warm, steady squeeze. I looked at the doctor and recognized him immediately. Red-headed with a thick ginger beard, he had written out a prescription over a year before which I still carried in my wallet. It read, Don't get hit on the head anymore. A quick glance at his name badge confirmed my memory. Dr. Levine, I'm Eli Marks. You saw me after I got a concussion last year. Have you stopped getting hit on the head? I couldn't believe he remembered this specific incident, so I assumed this was a standard line he gave to any patient who had taken a blow to the head. I do my best every day, I said. Good to hear, he said. As I was just telling Megan here, your friend Tracy is a very lucky lady. She took quite the fall and amazingly broke nothing but her noggin. How badly? There was so much blood, Megan added. Head wounds are notorious gushers, Levine said. She's got a nasty concussion and we're watching for internal bleeding, which is why I wanted to stay the night. We did an initial CAT scan and didn't see any evidence of epidural or subdural hematomas, but I want to keep an eye on her for the next 12 to 16 hours. He glanced down at the chart he was holding and then looked up at us. That being said, she could have easily broken an arm, a leg, her back, he continued, then paused and added, even her neck. As if on cue, Megan and I both turned to look into the room where Tracy lay motionless. Has she been conscious at all, I asked, addressing my question first to the doctor and then adding Megan. Did she say what happened? She's been in and out, Megan said. I asked her if she saw what happened and all she said was, someone knocked the ladder over. She didn't see anyone. It struck me for the first time that someone had tried to run me down just a few feet from where Tracy had fallen. I flashed back on the two of us standing outside the projection booth, leaning in to see Tyler's body and the evidence which lay around him. Megan must have seen the puzzled look on my face. What's wrong? I shook my head. Nothing, I said, trying to put my thoughts into words and giving up. N nothing at all. I was still thinking about that coincidence as we made the short drive back to our neighborhood. Lucky thing you found her, I said, breaking the silence which had enveloped us since leaving the hospital. If it hadn't been me, it would have been someone else. I mean, people walk up and down that sidewalk all day. Still, you were there. You made the call. Speed is imperative in these things, I said. It was a good thing I had my phone because, as you know, I don't always carry it. We both smiled at this admission as my inability to reach her by phone had been an ongoing sore point in our relationship. She shook her head, then the smile faded away. Oh, Eli, there was so much blood. Who would do something like that? I mean, just run up and do that. I shook my head. A lot of wacko people in the world, I said, patting her leg ineffectually, the physical equivalent of saying, they're there. The mention of blood brought me back again to Tyler's body in the projection booth. I searched for a connection with Tracy's fall and with my literal run-in with a car the other night and came up short on both fronts. How's everything at the store? I said, trying to steer us into more innocuous territory. Megan's store, Chi and Things, occupied the corner of Chicago and 48th Street and offered a full complement of crystals, aromatherapies, healing balms, and other holistic tchotchkes and doodads. Megan had inherited the entire block from her grandmother and took over the empty corner shop, making her first fledgling attempt into the often stormy and unpredictable waters of retail. The inheritance also made her my landlady, a fact which never ceased to amuse me. It's okay. We had a sudden influx of used New Age books, she said, apparently relieved to be talking about something more mundane, without an equal increase in sales of new New Age books. People are unloading old books, but not buying new books? I guess, she said. I have no idea what it means. Several more moments went by, and then Megan made a conversational stab of her own. 
Anything going on in the magic shop, she said. I considered this. We finally had a black guy come in and ask if we had any black thumb tips, I said. That was nice. So I was able to prove to Harry it had made sense to make that small investment in our inventory. That's great, she said, with a tad more enthusiasm than was really required. How many did he buy? I thought back on the encounter. None, but I feel it was a small inclusionary victory for the world of Chicago magic. Oh, absolutely. We drove in silence, and then she suddenly perked up. Oh, I forgot to tell you. At breakfast with Q, he said I could be part of his stage act this week. He's going to cut me in half, or thirds or something. Isn't that cool? Excuse me? It took great effort on my part, but those were the only words I could make my mouth produce which weren't inflammatory or obscene or both. He's doing a corporate show this week and said he was looking for an assistant for a trick of some kind. A ziggy or a, a zaggy or something. Zigzag, I suggested through gritted teeth. That's it, zigzag. He says it's like sawing a woman in half, but different. Yes, it's a very famous effect, a staple among magicians, I said coldly. And you're going to be part of his act, I continued as calmly as possible. Yes, I think it's downtown somewhere on Thursday night. You are going to be part of his act, I repeated. You, who have vehemently and heatedly objected if I ever accidentally revealed or even hinted at how a trick is done. You, who, and I'm quoting here, never ever wants to know how a trick is done. This same person is going to rehearse and perform the zigzag as part of Quentin Moon's act. Did I get that right? I think my tone must have gotten through to her, for her response was now as cold as mine. I don't understand what the problem is, she said sharply. You've asked me to help out with your act in the past. Yes, and every time, let me repeat, every single blessed time you have declined on the grounds that you, and again I quote, don't want to know how the trick is done. But apparently you have no such compunction with Mr. Hotshot Euro Trash Magician. Who? Oh, right, she said, realizing I was talking about Quentin. Eli, I don't see why you're getting so upset. Do you want me to say no? I would love for you to say no, I said quickly. Fine, I'll say no, she said as I pulled up in front of her building. Is that what you want? I said, trying to take some of the emotion out of my voice. No, but apparently it's what you want. We stared at each other for a long moment, and then she turned and stepped out of the car. I'll think about it, she said. Good, but she never heard my final words as the slamming of the car door cut off the rest of my sentence. How would you feel if your girlfriend performed in another magician's act? I don't have a girlfriend. Hypothetically, then. Nathan considered the question thoughtfully. If I had a hypothetical girlfriend, I'd be so grateful I probably wouldn't mind if she performed in another hypothetical magician's hypothetical act. This conclusion reached, he looked across the counter at me. But that's not the answer you were looking for, was it? We were hanging out in the magic shop, and I had brought him up to speed on Quentin Moon's breach of magic etiquette. Harry hadn't gotten up yet when I stopped in for our morning breakfast ritual. He begged off for just a few more minutes or maybe an hour of sleep, so I ate a bowl of Cheerios over the sink and opened the store early. Nathan stopped by to refill his stock of balloons for a kid's party, complaining how nowadays the kids were always asking for weird animal breeds when he took requests. I understand not every kid is going to make my day easier by asking for a wiener dog, he explained. But what the heck am I supposed to do with a request for a golden doodle? We commiserated about this and Quentin's betrayal for several minutes and could have continued for several more when we were interrupted by a phone call. I knew it was from my ex-wife before I had even taken the phone from my pocket, signaled by the ringtone I'd assigned to her. The Stones, it's all over now. We're visiting the final suspect Mr. Lyme provided later this morning, she said, without any greeting or fanfare. How did it go with Mr. Cavanaugh? 
I thought back on the sad millionaire and his hidden and highly suspect art collection. Nothing to report except to say he's a bit of an odd duck. But you probably already gathered as much. Who was it that said that quote about the rich? They are different from you and me. I think it was Fitzgerald. Barry or Geraldine? No, you movie geek idiot. F. Scott. And he was right. They are a whole different breed. And if you don't believe me, wait till you meet the next one on your list. What do you mean? Just wait, was all she said before hanging up. Is this the second or third time that we have heard from uh, uh, Dr. Levine? That's an excellent question. I know he's been in at least twice. I know he's been in at least twice. Well, I I don't think he's in. Boy, oh boy. Someone who has a better knowledge of his own book series would know whether Dr. Levine was in the second book or not. But he certainly uh, is making an appearance here. He is based on one of my favorite GPs I ever, ever had. He'd worked for the ER for years and then became a GP for a year or so, which is when I had him. And he was just the best doctor. And I called to make an appointment uh, one day and they said, ah, he's not here any longer. He went back to the ER because it was just too boring here. Oh, and so is he still practicing? I believe he is. But the only way I could see him is if I went into the ER and we're trying to avoid those moments. Yeah, I've had them, but I'm trying to avoid them. You don't want that at all. I don't want that at all. You know what I love, though? What I love is that when we scratch the surface on your books and your characters, I always find that, oh, this guy is based on this, and this person was based on this person that I had as a GP once. As yeah. a, I love that, that it's uh, that they aren't just uh, uh, cut from whole cloth, that you are tailoring uh, these characters based on somebody you already are familiar with, which I think is phenomenal. They got to come from somewhere. And I think I mentioned last time or the time before that uh, many of the suspects in the miser's dream are their names come from titles of Thomas Gifford mystery thrillers that he wrote here in the Twin Cities in the late 70s, early 80s. And Chip Cavanaugh from that last chapter is, in fact, uh, one of those. The Cavanaugh Quest is one of Tom Gifford's books, uh, The Wind Chill Factor probably being the most famous of them. That's the only one I know. I didn't know there were more. I, uh, the windshield factors is my frame of reference. And that's it. it. That was a huge hit for him. It was. Uh, and it was, the, I believe the story was that he was talking to an editor and just happened to mention in passing, well, that the windshield factor here is 22 below, which is, you know, we have that all the time here. And the yeah. editor had said, the what? And he said, the windshield factor. And he said, okay, you need to write a book called The Windchill Factor. And Windchill really has very little to do with that book, but it does have Nazis. A lot of his books ended up having Nazis. Yes, exactly. I, uh, right now on my Facebook page, I have a picture of Captain America saying, I want you to punch Nazis. Um, yeah, interesting. And a- as we spoke in the last episode, these little teeny itsy bitsy moments that uh, show up in your life, that send you on a trajectory that you never anticipated. Richard Wiseman's grandfather, an yeah. editor saying, well, you ought to write a book called The Windshield Factor, becomes his biggest bestseller. At the, these little teeny things, I think I, I'm fascinated by the, those moments in life which change the trajectory or set the trajectory, depending on how you want to think about it. It's just fascinating to me. And sometimes you don't see them until years and years later. Yeah. As you, I think, mentioned, you can't connect the dots in the Tina, in this interview with Tina Leonard. You can't connect the dots except in retrospect. You, they yeah. just but you it's can't see them. Fascinating. I remember talking with uh, Edie Falco who, from The Sopranos. Yeah, yes, Sopranos. I was interviewing her about a, a low budget movie she'd been in called Judy Berlin. If you get a chance to see Judy Berlin, uh, it's an excellent, uh, excellent movie with a stellar cast. For a low budget movie, Judy, Julie Kavner, Bob Dishy, I think it was Madeline Kahn's last movie, mm. and Edie Falco. Anyway, she was saying, we were talking about The Sopranos, and she said, I almost didn't go to the audition. I was oh. tired of auditioning. I was actually tired of acting. Uh, I didn't feel well. It sounded like the stupidest sounding series I'd ever heard. And um, I wasn't going to go. My agent said, oh, just go. Just go. And it changed her life. 
There you go. Another minute uh, in the Change Your Life uh, series of uh, Jim Cunningham's Keeping Track here. Yeah. Uh, just go. All right, I'll go. I don't want to. And now I'm a huge honking television star on The Sopranos. And speaking of uh, honking television stars, next episode, we're going to uh, talk to Jeffrey Hatcher, who oh. we both know here from the Twin Cities, but listeners will know from the movies that he's written, like The Good Liar, Mr. Holmes, Stage Beauty, the plays that he has written. He has stuff running all the time, including a couple original Sherlock Holmes and I believe he adapted at least one of Larry Millett's Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. books. He has, uh, by the request of the estates of the original author, was asked to update Wait Until Dark and Dial M for Murder. I saw it Dial M. Did I tell you that? That was his version. I went largely because it was his production. Uh, and it was brilliant. The yeah. cast was brilliant. The script was updated impeccably. Uh, he didn't change it enough so that you had that he kept it where it belonged in mm -hmm. time, but was able to add some nuances to it that were just, oh, it was great. And he wrote a Columbo. So we'll talk to him about oh. working with Peter Falk and all of that. So next time, that's going to be our chat with Jeffrey Hatcher, the always interesting, the always funny, the always charming, the always a little bit sardonic Jeffrey Hatcher. And then, uh, boy, I think it'll be chapter 11 of The Miser's You're Dream. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You've done the math correctly. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a great episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.